Welcome everybody week 16 day one. We're gonna run through a couple of my PowerPoint presentations and then we'll move back into Quake C. So, um, and this applies to Quake C as well. So in a, um, in a game, basically games are broken down into frames, right? And so your server will handle a frame of time and that, you know, if the, if the server is running at um, 10 frames per second, then 10 times per second, the server will update the state of the world, broadcast any updates to the clients. The clients will actually oftentimes run not at 10 frames a second. That would look really chunky. The client might run at 60 frames a second, or if you have a higher refresh rate monitor, 144 or 240 or something like that. Depends how fast your graphics card is and how fast your monitor is. Um, now, if you update fast enough, then everything seems to be smooth and seamless and in motion. If the frame rate dips enough, then it turns into a slideshow. And when it dips, it really, really irks us as gamers. And so you, you have to be very careful to make sure that your frame rate does not drop below 30, I would say. Any, any below 30, and you're gonna, you're gonna have a bad time, right? Uh, traditionally, monitors would refresh, LCD monitors traditionally would refresh 60 times a second. And so if you took a little bit longer than uh, um, uh, a 60th of a second, you'd actually not get like 59 frames a second, you'd get 30. Because you'd be missing every other update from the monitor. Like if you took a little bit longer than a 60th of a second, your frame rate would drop from 60 to 30. And then if you went a little bit longer than a 30th of a second to handle a frame, your frame rate would drop from 30 to 15 and then your game's unplayable. And so you have this really, and, and, and G-Sync helps, helps with that. If you guys know what G-Sync is or uh, AMD's FreeSync, which is their alternative to G-Sync. Um, basically with that, the monitor itself does not update until the graphics card says a new frame is ready. And so rather than the monitor just updating every 60th of a second, and if it's ready, it's ready. If it's on, it's not. Then what happens is the monitor waits for the GPU to send a frame of, uh, picture data over, then it updates. And so you can have frame rates of 58 frames a second, 57 frames a second. It makes things a lot smoother than with the old V-Sync 60 frames a second monitors. So if you're a gamer, you definitely want to get a G-Sync or a, a free sync uh, monitor if you can. Uh, the only downside to G-Sync monitors is they're expensive. They add quite a bit of cost to a monitor and they only work with NVIDIA graphics cards, especially with the shortage of NVIDIA and the price of NVIDIA graphics cards right now being locked into buying a NVIDIA graphics card is not ideal, but they are nice, they are nice. So one of our big goals as uh, game developers is to make sure that we squeeze every ounce of performance we can out of our game. And so there's a lot that goes into that. Um, if you're using Unreal Engine or Quake uh, id Tech 1, they have all sorts of clever algorithms that try to process as few triangles per second as possible onto the screen. The more, th more things you're drawing onto the screen, the slower your game runs. Also, the more AI you have running every second, uh, the slower the game becomes. AI could be quite CPU intensive. Um, how does motion picture look so good at 24 frames a second? It's actually 24 frames a second twice. It, it actually displays every frame twice to make it look a little smoother. But um, it's also just because we're used to it. When The Hobbit came out in 60 frames a second, people were getting motion sickness from it because it was so smooth. It, it felt like it was watching like a soap opera because soap operas oftentimes are filmed in 60 frames a second. And people really didn't like it. People hated The Hobbit at 60 frames a second. I didn't mind because I'm a gamer. But uh, a lot of people are just, that's how movies look. They, they, uh, you know, they're just not used to seeing movies looking smooth. Um, so, um, the soap opera effect in 4K TVs also, yeah. When they'd interpolate between things to get 120 frames a second, th things are sliding around on the screen and people are just like, ah, uh, you know, give me my, give me my slideshow. But yeah, gaming at 24 frames a second is miserable. You can turn off VSync and then you'll get screen tearing. So what happens is that it's the, the monitor is updating the the monitor is updating the the frame and then the picture changes. And so if something's moving, you'll have half of the box here and half the box here, and it looks kind of bad. 
So I usually play with a decent con back in the day, and nowadays I have a G Sync monitor, two G Sync monitors, and so I don't have to deal with those issues anymore. So you want to you want to make sure your game is able to run at 60 frames a second. And there's two different bottlenecks that you have to worry about. First is your GPU. So you have to make sure you don't have so many triangles on the screen that your GPU is struggling, right? Your GPU needs to be able to render all the triangles on the screen in a 60th of a second. You've also got your CPU and your CPU is going to be running AI calculations and it's going to be running, um, you know, it's going to be handling reading and writing to the network and handling input and the mouse and uh, figuring out what level should be loaded and unloaded and things like that. There's a lot going on in the CPU too. And so you will get the worst of the two. So if you have a really good GPU and a really crappy CPU, then you're actually going to be what's called CPU bottlenecked. Your CPU is going to be limiting your frame rate. And contrast, if you have a really fast CPU and a really terrible GPU, then you will be GPU bottlenecked. And that's probably more common these days. Although some games are CPU intensive. Like um, a lot of strategy games, they're not very demanding graphics wise. But, you know, like European Universalis is simulating an AI for every country in the world. So a lot of my friends' computers can't handle it at five speed, like the max speed, because it, I don't know, or it might just be their network just sucks. I don't know, one or the other. So you need to, you need to think about both of those and try to minimize the CPU load and minimize the GPU load on both. So there's a lot of things about culling geometry, like we talked about how like we only draw the front of a triangle, not the back. But there's a lot more than that. Like we have something called a view frustrum, which uh, is like your FOV, minimum draw distance, maximum draw distance. Everything that's within that pyramid um, gets drawn. Everything outside of it gets discarded. And so there's a lot of techniques that figure out if something is behind you, instead of in front of you, it's behind you, I can't see it, discard it, don't draw it. If it is in front of me, then is it occluded by something else? Is there a wall and you're trying to draw a monster behind a wall? And there's a lot of very clever algorithms that will figure that out. So like in IdTech 1, it's designed for in, internal areas. It doesn't really do outdoor areas at all, really. Uh, it's, it's kind of a quarter shooter quake. And so, although there are, you, 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 could, you could do outdoor maps if you wanted. Uh, it's really not optimized for it. It's optimized for indoor areas. And what it does is it computes for every spot on the world, what other spots it can see. Um, Unreal Engine has something similar to that as well in their code. And so what you can do is say, if I'm standing in this location, I cannot see, you know, things over there. So throw all the geometry away, don't even load it, don't even try and process it. And so there's a lot of techniques that we use to keep our frame rates high. Um, I have an i5 10 Gen 6 core 12 thread CPU. Any good? Sure, that's fine. It's quite quite adequate for for gaming, I'd say. Um, you're you're probably not going to be CPU bound in too many games these days, anyway. But uh, yeah, that that's yeah, that'll that'll be great in most games. Like you don't need yeah you know, 100 cores. Most video games aren't very multi-threaded at all. So, um, so how, this is how a game works, okay? So every frame, the server is gonna do this. Let's say you're playing Pac-Man or something, right? And so it's gonna read, uh, it's gonna read from uh, the user's keyboard and mouse, whatever you're using to control Pac-Man. You're hitting W, okay, move Pac-Man north. Then every, frame, everything that you have in Unreal Engine called event tick in id tech one, if you have a think function that's going to come up, everything function that comes up runs. So if you constantly have things running on the next frame, then um, it's going to start chewing through your, your CPU cycles. Um, and so you can do event tick in Unreal Engine to run on every frame. But again, if you got too many of these things, it's going to start eating through your CPU. Uh, speed and it, and once you know you are going over a 60th of a second for everything you're doing then your frame rate starts dipping so you need to be very very cautious with those things if you have one or two objects that run event tick it's fine it's not a big deal but you like some some people get carried away and have like i don't know yandere simulator level nonsense where like every ai is updating every frame and 
thing thing explodes. Okay. Uh, what about video editing or something? Is that more CPU or GPU heavy? Great question. So it depends. It depends where they're doing the processing. So traditionally, uh, things like Handbrake are used for um, benchmarking, actually. Um, but as time goes on, people have figured out how to use um, how to use this CPU to do more and more of the computations. And the graphics cards companies have been making it easier and easier to offload hardcore processing to the graphics card. And so, um, so Handbrake is, is a video codec um, translator, I guess. And um, it's, it's typically used to benchmark CPUs, but you know, I don't know if, I don't know if they've uh, done CUDA and things like that to, if they've done GPU acceleration. If they have, then it'll it'll stress both. But yeah, video video uh, processing traditionally is one of those areas where you actually want to have as many cores and as many threads as you can. Like um, Threadripper uh, is a like video editing is a classic example of why you'd want to buy a Threadripper from AMD. Interesting, all caps. Um, but uh, you also want to have a good GPU because um, if, like I said, if they offload anything onto onto the graphics card to do processing then the faster your graphics card, the faster it will go as well. So uh, just spend a lot of money, doll, and get the top tier of both. <laughs> okay, so every frame, the the code is gonna update any, any think function that needs to run, any event tick. Uh, it's gonna process your input, things like that. If you wanna be clever, you have the AI run twice a second, three times a second. Um, Pac-Man, I think the uh, ghosts only run AI when they get to an intersection. So as long as the ghost is traveling down a quarter, it doesn't actually run its AI at all. Um, so it only when it when it gets to a decision point, like an open spot where the ghost can move in either direction, then it will make a decision and decide which way it should go. And each of the ghosts actually has a different AI, which I didn't know. Um, one of the one of the ghosts will move in whatever direction you're pushing. So if you're pushing north on the stick, the ghost will move north. Another one of the ghosts will move south if you're pushing north. Um, another one will always move towards you. Another one moves randomly, I think. It, it's been a while since I've looked at it, but there's actually four different AIs for the ghosts, and that's what causes them to sort of disperse around the screen and yet still chase you. They're not just moving randomly. So... Um, um, so if they're not running the AI, how do they kill you? Well, you, you have a, a, a touch function. And so typically your game engine will have some sort of collision detection engine. And these things we talked about more in uh, IS50B, but um, you need some method of determining if two objects are overlapping each other. And if they are, you call the touch function on them. Okay. In Unreal Engine, it's called on uh, hit, right? And so when two objects hit each other, it calls the hit function and it, tells you who the other guy you hit is. And so in uh, in uh, Quake C, uh, the touch function gets called and it passes to it the other person that you ran into. And in uh, Unreal Engine, it's on event on hit, and it will give you a hit structure that tells you everything you could possibly imagine about the other person, what body part you touch. It sounds really bad, out of context. And uh, the material and um, the skeleton bone and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then the other person gets called as well. In something like Pac-Man, the collision detection engine would probably just run every frame saying, is uh, Pac-Man, which is a square, is it overlapping any of the four squares for the ghosts or for the cherry power items or the dots or the um, power pills or whatever they're called or the cherries, right? Pretty simple. Uh, determining if two squares overlap each other is really, really simple, <laughs> right? It's just a couple of if statements to see if one square overlaps another one. It's very simple uh, computation. Whereas it's really, really annoying and difficult to do it for arbitrary 3D shapes. There's uh, various algorithms to do that, but they're, they're just kind of irritating to write, something like that. And they're slower too. Okay, so uh, every object in the world has a touch function that gets called when it touches something in the world. And it's got a think function that uh, will get called periodically 
in Quake C if you want it to. It doesn't have to. So, for example, for a rocket, we have a think function on it that just gets called after five seconds. And so, after five seconds, if it hasn't hit anything, then it just removes itself. So you don't have infinite things in there. So, um, all actors in a world go through the same life cycle. They're spawned, they're created. They then touch and think. That's about all they can do, touch and think. And yeah. And maybe it's part of their think function or their touch function, or maybe they have some other event on them. Like you can set up um, event overlap, which is similar to a touch function. So you can have like a, a demon that has like an invisible uh, sphere around it that when it, when the player overlaps it, the demon wakes up and tries to kill them or something like that. It's very similar to a touch function. Uh, or you can set up other events like um, if the user makes a noise near them, then you can set up a... Um, like the uh, Unreal Engine has a perception system. And so you can give the demon hearing and you can say if somebody makes a noise in this cone, call this event on me and I'll wake up or whatever. So gunfire would wake it up and that kind of stuff. And then eventually they, they get destroyed. And all of them will get destroyed eventually. You know, when the, the game quits, right, they'll get destroyed eventually. Um, and you, you want to you make sure to destroy things when you can. Because otherwise you've got, like, if you've spawned all these demons and they're dead, and you don't remove them, and they're still running the AI three times a second, all those corpses are going to be running their AI three times a second. Is an enemy near me? Is there an enemy near me? Is there an enemy near me? You know, and your, your CPU is going to go... And actually, as a, one of the more amusing bugs um, I've ever seen, um, I forgot to have the... Let's see, if you kill the demon in my game, the body would go away, but the head would remain. And the head was still running the AI on the demon. And it was dead, so you couldn't kill it. It was just a head. And in, in the game, you can kick the heads around and things like that. It's just kind of amusing. But it was still running the AI. And so you would walk up, you'd walk past some of these dead heads and it would start growling at you. And depending on which way they were oriented, they could actually jump. And so you'd walk past and this head would just start launching itself and start trying to bite you. And there's nothing you can do to it because it's already dead. You can't damage it any further. And so this thing would, and this head would, and it would, and it would jump at you. And you're like, oh, damn, dude. And you're shooting it and absolutely nothing's happening. My daughter actually wanted me to keep that bug in the game because uh, she loves bugs. She loves Cyberpunk 2077. I don't know why. But um, yeah, it, it's it's a bad thing to have your AI running every frame. But in this case, it was actually really hilarious because these heads would just launch themselves at you. and I'd, I'd, I'd eventually get rid of them by like standing in front of a lake and they would jump at me and I'd, and I'd dodge out of the way and then the head would fall into the lake and you'd just hear the head splashing around in the lake trying to get out. Um, I like Cyberpunk 2077 for other reasons. Yeah, my daughter loved it because of the bugs. So. Um, yeah, and so you want to you want to destroy these things uh, when you can. Uh, and also every time they're updating, if they're moving, that's going to start eating to your network performance. You always have to be very cognizant of your network usage. The Unreal Engine has automatic replication. It's pretty easy to set up if you want to set up a multiplayer game. It's pretty easy to set up. There's a few. Uh, things you got to do. There's some videos I can recommend you guys on them if you want to make it multiplayer. It's not too bad. Um, but you have to be very cognizant of your network performance. Um, if you make a lot of entities that are moving around and they're changing their, the direction they're moving, it, it's actually not too bad if you have like a lot of things just moving in a straight line. Because that actually doesn't require network updates every frame. Because they're moving in a straight line. You've given it a position, you've given it a velocity, it's gonna the 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 clients know okay if it started there and it moves this way it'll you know the clients can update them you don't need to send them any any network information at all but curve flight or if you have things zigzagging randomly or something like that that every time they change direction you've got to send another network packet out to every client that could see them and so that could become very very quickly very expensive. And so like for my frag grenades, that's one of the reasons why I limit only one frag grenade can be in the world at once because it sends out a ton of nails in different directions and they all bounce off walls and things like that to create a volumetric explosion. And uh, that, like you can watch the network 
go up like that every time you do it. And so I only allow one of them in the world at once that tries to cap uh, how bad the impact is. Because before, people would start spamming them and, and, and you would just get a disconnected symbol <laughs> in the top left corner, never. And it's just trying to update all these different fragments bouncing around, possibly changing directions three times a second as they're zigzagging and ricocheting around and things like that. So, um, yeah, you gotta be very cautious with your network, networking. Hit scan weapons are kind of nice for that reason. They don't have to even create a projectile, right? If you do a hit scan weapon, it's at, at worst, it's going to make a puff of smoke where it hits, you know, it's pretty easy. Miss draw a bullet there. Yeah. That's it. Every time they click, you know, that's, you know, that's not too bad. You, you, you know, even, even if you have a 56 K modem, you can handle a person clicking once or twice a second. Yeah. It's not, it's not a big deal. So be careful making lots of things. Be careful having them update and change things that they're doing. Two bombs would disconnect you. Nah, probably not two. Two would be laggy. Four would probably disconnect you. Yeah. So. All right. So uh, now that you've got actors that are moving, they're thinking, they're touching uh, in the world. Um, so how do they see? How do they shoot? That's tracing. So you have touch, think. Touch, think, and trace, right? The three T's. Right, and so there's a bunch of different trace functions. In Quake C, all you have is trace line and find radius. Trace line sends an invisible line through the world and tells you what you hit. And find radius gives you everything in a radius around a point. In Unreal Engine, there's more complicated things, like you could take a box and slide an invisible box through the world to make sure there's enough room for you to walk into it. Trace line only tells you if you have line of sight between one point and another, but that doesn't tell you if there's like an open corridor to walk down. So uh, we have to fake that by doing multiple trace lines. Like we would draw um, a line between my eye and your foot, my eye and your head, left foot, right foot, left shoulder, right shoulder, top of the head, center of body. And if all of those are open, then I'm like, okay, there's an open corridor between me and you. Is that, but even still, there could be like some weird geometry that just wasn't hit by those lines. And it would, the AI would try running forward and get stuck on it. So... Um, the Unreal Engine version where you can actually take a capsule, which is the, uh, what is typically used for bounding a human, and you can slide a capsule through the world and make sure there's an open quarter, which is nice. So in Unreal, Unreal Engine, that'd be called Single Line Trace by Channel. Quake C, it's called Trace Line. And uh, if you want to only hit certain kinds of objects in Unreal Engine, you can do that as well. So uh, trace a square through the world in front of me and tell me if there is a demon in front of me, right? Which is useful if you're like, uh, you're casting some holy bolt spell. It's going to blast in a blast wave of holy energy forward. You can do a trace, uh, you know, you take a, I don't know, whatever shape you want, square maybe, rectangle, shoot it through the world and have it only impact demons. And so if there's a human there, the the blast goes right over them, no effect, but the first demon hits, takes 100 damage or something. So you can filter things in Unreal Engine that way. In Quake C, um, you can choose an object to ignore. So don't hit me. That's about as good as you can do. And so when it hits, when it hits things, you can say, is it a demon? No? Okay, keep going. Is it a demon? Yes? Okay, stop. Okay. Um... Yeah, and if you want to find all demons along the line, you can use a multi-land trace. And in uh, in Quake C, what you do is you just do another trace line from the point that you hit. So when you hit a point, if you want it to keep going, you do another trace line starting at that 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 location. Uh, finding everything in a radius is a sphere trace. So in, in a real engine, you can do a sphere trace on your point to get everything within a sphere. In Quake C, it's called uh, find radius. So that is kind of how you do interactivity in a, in a video game. Um, yeah, uh, let me go 
Okay. I'm going to go ahead and take a five minute break right now. Um, so I need to check on my, uh, my wife. She's, she's got a migraine right now. So I'm going to, I'm going to call a five minute break right now and I will come back in five or 10, something like that. See how she's doing. Okay. See you guys. Yeah. Pause the video. And we are back. Uh, just remember to work on your, uh, Unreal Engine 4 projects and propose your mod, uh, next week. And you'll have a couple weeks to, to work on it. You'll have till the end of the semester to finish your mod and send it to me. Uh, we'll just, during finals week, there won't be a final. You'll just uh, schedule a time with your group and me and we will play your game. As simple as that. Or we can set up a time where everyone can show off their stuff, maybe on Friday of finals week, so the very last day possible. And it's always kind of fun to have everybody playing your game at once. It's kind of neat. Okay, so uh, when you have time and if you have a lot of frames, one of the things that's really important is to make sure that you normalize velocity, right? You don't want spaceships flying faster if you have a higher frame rate computer. So we do something called a delta time. So delta time is how long it has been since the last frame. So if it's been a tenth of a second, the delta T would be 0.1. And so what we always do is say, how far do we move this frame? Your velocity times delta time. So if your velocity is you know 30 meters a second, and delta time is 0.1, then you're gonna move three meters this frame. And every frame the physics engine will run, every frame the every every frame you read from the mouse, from the keyboard, get input, read and write to the network, do the AI, the physics engine updates the position of everything in the world based on the velocity times delta time. And it will do collision detection. If there's a collision, it will call the touch functions on both people that got collided. And that's basically what goes into a game. That's what's kind of running behind the scenes. And then it'll network out the, at least from the server's perspective, the, and then it'll send out over the network all the updates to the clients that could potentially see things that could be changed. And then the clients on their end, they're running asynchronously. So they could be running 200 frames a second. The server doesn't know. The server runs 10 frames a second, at least in QuakeC. And so the, the clients will get updates every once in a while. And they'll say, oh, a rocket was created uh, at this position, moving at this speed. And so it'll, every frame, the client will also draw the rocket moving without the server needing to constantly tell it where it is. So when the, when the server says the rocket hit something and explodes, then it'll send an update to the client saying, the rocket hit, your health is now 80, draw an explosion at this point. And so it does everything it can to keep the networking to a minimum. Uh, there's other kinds of deltas as well. The last, how far your mouse has moved in a frame, um, how far your mouse wheel has moved in a frame, uh, thanks. Yeah, my wife's not having a good day today. So, uh, yeah. Okay. And so all these things are basically used like so you can normalize these things so that y y your code doesn't behave differently if you have a high frame rate or a low frame rate. Okay. Um, there are time dilation effects available, not in id tech one, uh, I don't think, but in um, Unreal Engine you can slow down time or speed up time which is kind of amusing. Uh, it doesn't work very well in multiplayer. Um, how do you, yeah. If somebody activates a power-up ability to slow down time, does everybody on the server slow down or just the people within a radius? I don't know, it's kind of weird. Um, so uh, it's usually only used in single-player games. So you do bullet time and dodge out of the way of bullets and things like that. What happened here? Uh, you can also get how long, in, in QuakeC, there's just a variable called time. It's a global. You can read from it, and it tells you how long it's been since the server turned on, basically. <laughs> and so you just, you know, everything is based on this variable called time. And in Unreal Engine, you got more options. Uh, if the game is paused, some of the timers will stop. Some of them will run. Um, so... Uh, if sound plays, you can see how long a sound has been playing for, things like that. Um, you can tie um, you can tie the motion of things to time. For example, my daughter in my previous class, I showed how she made a diorama um, that had a fish that would go up and down like this. And all I was doing was taking the time, feeding it into sign. And the result of that is, you know, how far the servo motor should move up or down. And, um, and it would just make this nice sinusoidal motion of the fish and then the brightness of the LEDs were also the sign of time and you can do things like divide 
by five to make it move slower, and or multiply by five to make it go faster. Um, so I slowed it down a lot, and so just gradually the lights would get brighter and, and dimmer. It would create this cool underwater effect because they're blue LEDs. They're, I had four of them, and they would brighten and dim in a pattern. So it create this. It looks like you're underwater. It turned out quite nice. So um, you do time of day, things like that. Okay, so time can be really annoying simply because your users can... Um, like if they alt tab out of the game and you do, like, like if you do something like say, um, you know, your position is equal to your position plus velocity times Delta T. What if Delta T is a hundred? What if it's been a hundred seconds since they last ran a frame? Uh, like if they alt tab out and then they're, you know, browsing the web and they come back in. Uh, there was a bug in a space game I used to play. I would turbo boost, I would afterburn, which you can normally do only do for a few seconds. I would afterburn up to full speed. I'd alt tab out, wait for a minute, alt tab back in, and the game would do the algebra and be like, okay, he should be on the other side of the solar system. And so it allowed me to travel across the solar system at afterburner speed because it just did a simple algebraic, okay, his position is equal to position plus velocity times delta t, and delta t is 100 seconds, and so... <laughs> He gets a hundred seconds of turbo boost, and uh, sometimes they'll use that trick to teleport through walls. Like if the step is so big, um, sometimes games determine collision by just doing like ten intermediate steps in between and seeing if any of those touch anything. And if you travel that far, those intermediate steps don't collide with anything, and you can teleport through walls and things like that as well. So, um, and and also when you only update ten. 10 times a second if you're trying to do an accurate physics simulation like orbital motions and things moving in circles and things like that then um, it gets really bad because <laughs> trying to simulate a, an orbit 10 times a second results in these really obnoxiously inaccurate looking physics simulations so um, physics are never easy physics are never easy but the um, there's always going to be physics bugs simply due to the fact they only run 10 times a second or something like that and so in general just try to avoid try to avoid making a game that needs accurate physics at that level unless that's really what um your game's about then you can invest a lot of time and energy into getting that to work okay um so uh, a delay uh, we know how to do this already in id tech if you want to have something happen after five seconds you set your next think to be a function and you set your think, sorry, you set your think to be a function. You set your next think to be time plus five. And then in five seconds, it'll call that function. Okay. And a timer, uh, so that's a delay. It's called a delay in UE4. And um, if you want to have something repeat every second or something like that, that's called a timer in UE4. Uh, and in Quake C, it's the exact same thing as a delay. You just at, after that function gets called, it sets itself back to run in time equals the next thing is time plus one and it just passes its own function back in and it'll sit there and call itself every second. So uh, let's go back into, yeah, we've gone over sequences before. Um, lifespan, you can set the lifespan on an object in UE4 so that after it's been in the world for like a minute, it deletes itself automatically. Um, that way you don't have to make a timer for literally everything to clean themselves up. So if you have projectiles and things like that, uh, like the ball, like the default ball in the first person shooter template, it's got a lifespan of like a couple seconds. So it'll bounce around. And then when it comes to stop, it vanishes. Okay, so, and we've gone over timelines before as well. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna get more into Quake C today. And can you hear me now, Lavi? I want to go over some more of the things you can do in Quake C. And again, uh, to do your modding, all you should really do is find things that exist and copy paste them, <laughs> right? And change them. You don't need to know all of Quake C. You don't need to know all this stuff. Um, I, I guess I can go over the basics of the language um, right now, probably. 
But in general, you should just play the game, find something similar to what you're looking for, and then use the power of control shift F. All right, where is that in the code? And either change that or copy paste it or something like that. That's the mindset you need to get into when you're doing modding. So you don't need to write everything from scratch. What you need to do is just find something similar to what you've done and use that as a model. Okay. So uh, there are built-in functions. These are the things you can do in Quake C. This is kind of like the standard library. These are all the things you can do in Quake C. And uh, I'll go over kind of the important ones right now. So make vectors, uh, you pass in an, an angle. So whichever direction the player is looking usually, you pass in. If we look at make vectors, you'll see it takes the uh, self.view angle. So that view angle is the direction the player is looking. And so it calls make vectors. It doesn't return anything. And the reason why it doesn't return anything is because it sets these global variables. So this is, yeah, maybe not how I would do it, but um, there are variables, there are global variables for what direction is forward, which direction is up, which direction is up, which, which direction is right. And that's it. Um, so you'll see make vectors called over and over again and grabbing the forward vector. And that's how you determine what direction you're looking. Uh, this gives you a, this gives you, that sets the V underscore forward vector that is the direction that you're looking. And you'll see this call over and over again. Okay. So uh, make vectors sets the globals. Yeah, there's uh, the global vector forward, vector up, and vector right. So whichever direction you're looking, it'll give you your local coordinates, which way you're looking forward, which way is to the right, which way is up. And you can mix those together to make a shot that comes out up and sideways or something like that by mixing together forward and up and right. Okay, uh, set origin sets the location of an object. So you pass in an object, an entity, and you pass in a vector. Uh, so an entity, is uh, created through spawn, right? There's a spawn function uh, somewhere down here, and uh, that makes a that makes an entity. An entity is actually just an integer under the under the hood. It's just an integer. It's just a. It's actually just an index into an array. There's just an array of all the entities in the world. It'd be like that one's number 100. That's all an entity is. It's just the index in the entity array. And so when you call set origin, you are saying set entity 100, set its origin to whatever vector you pass in. So for example, you could say, um, you could say set origin um, new missile. Let's say you've created an entity called new missile and you can set its origin to be 000. And so that would put it at the world 000 location. Um, usually you don't do that, you usually figure out its new location by taking your location, adding a little bit of the forward vector to it and saying that's its that's its new location. But I mentioned this uh, because the syntax of a vector looks like this. It's a single quote and three numbers inside of it. This is a special Quake C thing. You, you, you won't see this in C++ or anything like this. This is just part of the scripting language where they've, they've only got four variable types. There's only four types of variables. There's string, which holds uh, words there's entity, which under the hood is just an index into an array. It just is which actor in the world it is. There's vector, which is three floats, and there's float. Float is used for both ints and floating point numbers. And so it's got an interesting format that it actually works pretty well as an integer. It doesn't round off until the numbers get big or small. And a vector is just three floats. It's just three floats. And so you... Uh, can specify a vector by using single quote and putting three numbers with spaces in between it, and that will be passed in as a vector. So, um, set origin sets the position. Set model will change the model of an object. So, if you want, uh, if you want to make a mod where the user can Hulk out and turn into the Incredible Hulk, then you would call set model on you know self maybe set model self and 
change his model to be the Incredible Hulk or something like that, and you could probably import that. Uh, I don't know, use Blender or something. There's a, there's a Quake MDL. Um, this is the file format .mdl, and you can uh, probably export things in the, in the MDL format. You can probably find free versions of the Hulk or Blender works. Yeah, yeah, Blender works to export models. Um, set size uh, takes an entity again. Like if you wanted to set the size of yourself to be bigger, then like you Hulk out, then you need to call set size, and it it actually takes two vectors. The first is the uh, bottom left corner. Because every, every object in the world is represented by a bounding box. A bounding box is a rectangular prism that is a solid chunk of U. And so U and Quake are actually a box. And so if somebody shoots this spot right here, it'll hit you. Because you don't have a neck. You are a box. And when you call set size, it's going to be relative to the origin. So if your origin is your belly, uh, let's say, this is going to be your bottom left corner. So that's how far down... And to the left, your legs are, and the max is up and to the right. So it basically is the two corners of the of the bounding box. So uh, your left foot and your right sh shoulder above your right shoulder, like this. What's up, Chrome? You can play Skyrim. Go for it. And um, and so that sets the size of the bounding box. And so if you're going to Hulk out, then you would change the model. Uh, your origin might need to move up because you're going to be getting bigger too so you might need to do set origin up a little bit and then increase your size and then bullets will hit the new and improved you just make sure that you're not uh, uh like if there's a low ceiling and you try hulking out if you pop out of the world like that you will fall out of the world and die right and, it, and i'm sure we we've all seen that in video games right where you're just walking around and all of a sudden ah you know and you you fall through the world and, and that's due to those reasons um, in the in the last game, somebody shot me into a sentry gun, and with me inside of the sentry gun when it got built, I couldn't move. I was stuck inside of it. So you have to be very careful with these sorts of things. When you, when you set model and set size, they're very prone to be buggy. Um, break, uh, doesn't matter. Random generates a random number from 0 to 1. So every time you call random, it returns a float. And it's going to return a number from 0 to 1. 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.1, whatever. So you use that to get random numbers out. This plays a sound. We've talked about that before. I know at least one of you was saying something about uh, redoing all the sounds in the game as a mod. That'd be fun. Okay. Uh, normalize. You guys should know by now what a, how to normalize a vector, right? If you pass in a vector, like 10, 0, 0, it'll return 1, 0, 0. So I pass in a vector of length 10. It normalizes it down to unit vector, a, a vector of length 1. So uh, there is a normalized node in Unreal Engine as well. All of these things are st just the standard mathematical toolbox of video games. There is a standard toolbox of tricks involving dot product and cross product and normalizing vectors and things like that. And uh, the forward vector and all that stuff. It's just sort of common across all video games. And you, you just kind of have to get get used to it. Um, they're not They're not too bad, I don't think, to understand, but... Like I said, a lot of game programs, they don't teach the math side of things. And I don't know, maybe I would have more students left in this class if I didn't teach math, but I don't I don't know how it's possible to make games without math. I don't know. Every time I get to the math section, add three numbers to three numbers. <sighs> right? One plus one plus one. My students. Vector length tells you how long a vector is. That's the Pythagorean theorem. So if you pass in a vector of 10, 0, 0, it'll return 10. It's a vector of length of 10. Okay. We have to write programs to make games. I mean, we play a lot of games in this class. Like, I feel like this class is not too onerous. You know, I don't know. I don't know. Hopefully it'll be better once we go back in person because then you're, you're sort of trapped, you know, like, all right, we're playing board games. No, not board games. Here you go. I, I usually walk in with a giant pile of board games in a laundry bat basket, you know, I just bring in like 20 of them. I put them down like, we're playing board games today. <laughs> 
And in summer school, like the class is like three hours long. So we play board games. Like we play board games. <laughs> and we write about it and talk about it and things like that. In this class, I don't know. You're not a captive audience. So I don't know. So vector to yaw, uh, it, it tells you what direction you need to rotate to point in a certain direction. This is used for like um, AI targeting and things like that. So uh, vec to yaw. Yeah. So this is the direction that the, so uh, it creates a displacement vector. Remember how we talked about displacement vectors? So this will create a displacement vector pointing from my origin to the enemy origin. Vector yaw tells me what direction I need to rotate to be facing it. Okay. So that's in the AI code. So if you want to figure out how to rotate or uh, like my laser dot thing with a rocket tracing it, it would use vector yaw to figure out what, how much it should rotate to look at the dot. Spawn, uh, of course, it's the Todd McFarlane, you know, comic. <laughs> uh, spawn is uh, how you make a entity. So spawn will find the first open slot in the entity array. If there isn't one, it crashes the server. If there is one, it, it just returns an entity, which again, is just an int. All right, slot 242 is open and that's it. So this is the, this is the only way of adding things to the game. And this includes monsters and players and rockets and timers and delays and all these things. They're all spawn. Everything's just an entity. There's no classes like in Unreal Engine, there's different kinds of actors and things like that. Nope. Everything's just an entity. This is C. Welcome to C world. Okay. Remove takes an entity and deletes it out of the world. So if I pass an entity 242 here, it's gone. Bye bye. And this can cause problems sometimes if, like, um, let's say you leave the server and it deletes you, but you've still got a rocket in the world. Right? So let's say you've got a rocket in the world, you disconnect from the server, the rocket kills somebody. Then it tries to add one to the frag count, the score of somebody who's not there anymore, crash. And if you think that was fun to debug, it's not. This is oh, super annoying because anybody could just quit at any time, right? And so every time you ever do anything, you basically have to say, hey, is that guy still alive? <laughs> is that guy still around? Is that, a, does that entity still exist, you know? And that, yeah, that, that's, that's annoying to deal with. Okay. I think entities zero to no, zero is the world. Then entities one to 32 are the players. I think if I'm remembering right, I could be wrong. Um, okay. Trace line. We all know and love by now starting location, ending location. If it should ignore monsters, if it should ignore the player usually, and that will draw an invisible line through the world and tell you what you hit. And that's how you interact with the world most of the time. Uh, check client. Uh, I don't remember what that's for. Um, find if you want to find everything by class name. So uh, every object in the world has a class name. So if you want to do something like say, find all uh, uh, trip wires in the world, you can do that, and that'll return a linked list of all the different um, objects that are trip wires. So this is similar to the uh, Unreal Engine find all by class name uh, node. Precache sound, precache model. We've talked about that before. If you want to use any sound or any model in the game, you have to pre-cache it. That way the server, that, that way your client will load it prior to it appearing in the world. If, if it appears in the world and you don't have it loaded, it's got to load off the hard drive and there's going to be a noticeable lurch as it loads. And so by pre-caching everything, not only is it all loaded and advanced, but the server has a list of every sound, every model, every map that you're using. And when a client connects, the server sends a list. Hey, this is what we got. And then the client checks the list like, oh, I don't have that one. And so it says, hey, server, can you send me the sound for the gr gorilla explosion? Sure, the server says, and it will download it for you. And so by doing that, you can have a manifest of everything. You can, you can see if you can play on a server because some servers don't allow you to download the stuff. And so it'll just disconnect you saying you don't have the stuff you need to play. And so that's show me what you got. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, like if, if there was a paid DLC and you don't have the paid DLC, then it'll be like, sorry, you have to have this DLC to play on the server. 
or you can just have the server set to download you everything. It's, it's up to you. So, <laughs> stuff command. This is important. So stuff command takes a client. So for example, um, Vacalar and string will be sent to him for him to type at the console. He doesn't even know that he typed it. So if I send to Vacalar the string disconnect, then it will disconnect him from the server. It will be as if he typed the word disconnect. Or I could, or I could have him give the command um, flash the screen because there are certain client side commands mm -hmm. that you can't really do server side. And so, like for a long time, the trank, uh, the, not the trank, the um, the concussion grenade actually sent a command to the client saying turn your screen pure white. And so when a flash bang went off, you're like, ah, I can't see. But then people realize this is just the client side command, and they would hit the they would hit the command to clear the 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 flash off the screen. And so it's generally considered a bad idea to do it because if people know what command you're stuffing, they'll just stuff the, the opposite. But for doing things like disconnecting and stuff like that, it's quite useful. Or you can stuff a command to have Vacalar say, hey, everybody, do you like Pusheen? And you can, you can actually force clients connected to the server to do stuff. So uh, sometimes, sometimes very useful. Yeah, you can force them to alt f4 basically. Uh, find radius is the uh, other thing other than trace line, and find. So trace line, invisible line through the world. Find finds everything of certain type. Find all players. Find all demons. Find all rockets. Find radius returns everything in a circle around you, in a sphere around you. Okay. And that's the three ways you interact with the world, other than touch and think. That's how you see who's near you, see who you hit. You know, if you have an EMP grenade, the EMP grenade, you can say find every backpack in the world and then see if you're within a certain radius of the backpack using vector length, vector length, backpack's position, my position, subtract, vector length. If it's within 100, then detonate the backpack as a grenade. So that's, I'd probably not do that. I'd probably do find radius instead. Find, it, find all things within 100 and see if it's a backpack. If it's a backpack, then detonate it like a grenade. And that's how the MP grenade works. The MP grenade actually did, detonates ammo. So if you throw an ammo backpack on the ground, then an EMP grenade will detonate it like a grenade. And it blows ammo up on people. So if you're carrying a ton of ammo on you, EMP grenades are very, very dangerous. Okay, so uh, this is how you can print things to clients. This will broadcast. This will print... Um, strings and so we've kind of gone over that before um, debug print uh, sort of like debugging information but basically there's commands where you can broadcast things to everybody or you can print a string just for one person hey uh, you're in the lead good job or whatever uh, float to string vector to string useful for your printing stuff this costs five dollars so you pass five in it returns the string five uh, core dump, you're probably not going to use. Uh, you're not going to use those. You're not going to use that. Uh, that's used for AI. You're not going to use that. Drop to floor will snap something to the ground, like in Unreal Engine when you hit end, and it snaps it to the floor. Probably not going to use that. You're not going to use that. That's used for doing like flickering lights and things like that. Probably don't care about that. Rounding, floor, ceiling. So that rounds the nearest tent. This drops, like if you're at 5.9, it would drop to 5. Seal would take 5.9 and go up to 6. Um, check bottom. It's not as bad as it sounds. <clears throat> uh, it checks to see if you're on the ground right now. Uh, point contents. Oh, this is really useful. So um, point contents, you pass in a XYZ location for any point in the world, and it tells you what's there. Is it solid? Is it open? Is it lava? Is it water? Is it slime? And I think those are the only options. And so in, in IS50B, we talked about how point contents works on the server side. For you guys, you don't need to know how it works. But you can basically find any location in the world and log in time like very, very quickly. You can find out what's at a point. And so you can do that for like, um, should I be on fire? You know, things like that. Uh, absolute value. Aim is used for auto-aiming. So like if you're 
Like one of my pet peeves is that um, people play with controllers, and because controllers suck compared to the mouse, the people on controllers demand auto aim. So people on controllers demand that the game aim for them. So if you're just kind of pointed in the right direction, it'll the bullet will curve off to the side and hit them. So that does that. So you yeah. So that will do auto aiming for people. It's annoying. I mean, I don't know. It, it, it was really bad because like people on uh, Overwatch, I think they allowed crossplay between Xbox and PC. And Xbox had auto aiming turned on. PC had it turned off. But you could play with a mouse on the Xbox. And so there was like this huge competitive advantage I think Fortnite had a similar problem where like because of auto aiming like it just gave this huge competitive advantage to console gamers because they suck and so they compensated for them sucking and made them better than PC which uh, I don't know if Overwatch had crossplay but yes on Fortnite yeah uh, local command uh, will it's like stuff command whatever that was uh, so local command runs the command on the server so if you want to change maps, if you want to make it so your mod, so when you kill somebody, it goes to the next map. One shot, that's it, next level. <laughs> you could uh, do local command and you'd pass in, you'd, you'd write a command like this. Local command map to fort 5R, you know, and then every time you killed, some, you know, you put that in the, like the player death function or something like that, that would run on the server console, change the map to 245. And so first death, boom map change or you can use it for kicking players that's a pretty common thing too so if somebody's cheating you could do a local command kick player five knock them off the server that kind of stuff uh, which is better than uh which is better than stuff commanding because if you stuff command disconnect to them they could always have a client a cheater client that ignores it right they can be like mm -mm, no not today not doing a disconnect but if you do a local command and kick them it'll disconnect them off the server and you can also do a local command to ban their IP address as well. So, um, uh, don't worry about that. That's for the linked list thing. Particle effects. So there's different particle effects in Quake. Not a lot. Uh, one thing I wish they had done more of was having more particle effects. Um, light laser beams they have, uh, clouds they have. Not a lot. And so, this is, um, there, there are some particle effects. There's not a lot. I, I wish they had built more in, honestly. Uh, change yaw is used for AI. You don't need to worry about it. Basically, um, it's used with that vector yaw thing above where, so you can have a demon slowly rotate towards its target. So change yaw, it'll um, slowly rotate towards, and so if you run around it quickly, it, it'll be like, uh, you can sprint around it. Uh, vector angles, um, yeah, again, this is used for like if you have a displacement vector, what angle do you need to be looking at to, to look at it? This is used for networking, uh, don't use these directly, just copy paste other people doing them, or you're gonna break something. <laughs> Move to goal is also used for AI, pre cache file, don't worry about it, make static. Um, nice, um. Yeah, also don't worry about that one. Change level can also be used to change the map if you want. Um, C bars are, uh, you can set a variable on the server. And so you can set something like um, keys change auto to make a pet that follows you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if, like, if you want to have a pet that follows you, first of all, what I do is look at the AI code for the demon. So the demon will lock onto a target and then walk after you and then sometimes jump after you. And so that'll show you how you can use. Um, Move to goal, back to angles, uh, check bottom, like all these things. There's examples, right? So again, don't try to write anything from scratch. Just find people that have done it already. Yeah, it's it's a big mod. There's almost everything you can think of has been done at some point or another. Uh, center print will broadcast things in the middle of the screen. That's used for the menus, or when you first connect, there's a message of the day that that appears. Um, um, make sure you don't do that while there's a menu active. 
because then the center print you print will erase the menu because only one center print can be on the screen at once. <clears throat> Uh, more pre-caching stuff. Uh, CVAR. C CVAR. Yeah, so uh, CVAR is useful for doing things like this, where you can set the maximum speed, uh, turning on auto-aim. Eh, why is that on by default? Uh, turning on uh, the team play settings. The team play settings are used for, like, um, can you hurt your teammates? Do they take half damage? Do they take half damage from explosions? Do they reflect damage back at you, which is hilarious? So one of the best ways of dealing with people shooting their teammates is to reflect the damage instead. Because it's actually bad to not damage your teammates because then they'll, they'll just pile onto the enemies and you just throw a ton of grenades on your friends. Your friends are fine, the enemies die, and it's kind of lame, right? If you do reflected damage, though, then you actually have to be careful of your teammates because you kill yourself, right? So uh, there's a lot of team play settings like that um, that can set different, different things. And that's all... Done using CVAR set. Um, I think mo gravity can be set that way. So you can set gravity up and down. So you can have worlds with less gravity in it, which is kind of fun. Um, the amount of money. Um, the amount of money. Actually, that's us using info key here. So info key uh, sets a variable on the server. So um, you can say maximum kills until the next level. Um, how much money you get is je jello water on or off, on or off. And when, when something's an info key, it's actually publicly accessible. And so, uh, people can, when they, when they do a server browser, you know, they pull up a list of all the quake servers, they can see, oh, I want to go onto a server that has 20,000 money on it. And so they can sort it by the info key. So info keys are publicly, public variables, essentially public to the internet. Uh, multicast is part of that networking thing. Don't worry about it. Uh, string to float converts from a string to a float, as you can imagine. Um, doing the different colored text, which I know some of you guys are interested in. What's the length of a string? Um, it's AI stuff here. Uh, damage uh, is a lower level of that TFT damage function. Uh, TFT damage calls it. Um, okay, so that's it. These are all of the, there are 97, there are 97 functions built into the Quake server. And so when Quake C does anything, it'll eventually call one of these 97 functions. Those are the only things it can really do at the end of the day. And the most important ones are things like moving the origin of something, setting a touch function, setting a um, the next part down here, these are all the variables that have been created. So this dot float thing, what does that mean? That means, so there's only one, there's only one entity class in the entire world. If you guys have ever studied computer science, you know, there's these things called classes. And so you might have a player class and a monster class and a sentry gun class, and they all have different stats and attributes on them. Not in Quake C. In Quake C, everything is an entity. Every everything that appears in the world, players, demons, monsters, fish, rockets, sentry guns, everything is an entity. And so these are the member variables that every entity has. So every entity has a job. Does that mean a rocket has a job? Yes. That means a rocket has a job. Does a rocket have an inventory count for how many grenades it has in its first slot? Yes. Are they used? No. <laughs> is this memory efficient? Not really. Because every time you make a bullet or a nail that flies out in the world, it needs to allocate memory for its... Is that nail out in the world cheating? Is it hacking a, a sentry right now? Is it malfunctioning? No, none of these are used. And all of these are like four bytes of memory. However, remember Quake runs on 32 megs of RAM. Not gigs of RAM, megs of RAM. And so it's all right. You know, it's all right. It, it offends me a little bit that a nail that exists for a third of a second is going to have a, a job member variable that's not used, and it's going to have a, a player class that's not used. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter, honestly. So uh, this, all these dot float things here, 
are just adding member variables to the global entity class. So every entity in the world, a torch, a torch has a is building float. Do they have child classes? No, everything is just entity. So yeah, a zombie has a got aliases member variable on it. It's just not used. It's not used. This is, this is how you do inheritance without inheritance. You just put everything in the base class. Everything that any entity could ever need and any entity could ever want, all of them go into the base class. All there is is entity. A grenade is going to have a number of grenades. Is that used? No, it's not. <laughs> all these things are just not used on most things. So it's just, uh, yeah, you know, and, and coming from like an object oriented perspective, you're like, it's just incredibly wasteful of memory, right? Like you're just making all these extra variables that are just not used by anybody. Uh, but you know what? Not having to worry about inheritance, saying it is nice because inheritance sucks. And so instead of having to worry about inheritance, um, instead every variable, ha every entity has a class name on it somewhere. String class name somewhere. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of member variables, by the way. Max ammo shells, armor allowed, max armor, weapon mode. Yeah, so a torch on the wall is going to have whether or not it's displayed the message of the day yet. Guess what? It hasn't. You know? It's fine. Really, it's fine. So every every entity is going to be like, I don't know, like a K of RAM or some, some incredibly wasteful amount of memory like that. But remember, there can only be, I think, uh, if you count static entities and things like that, I think it's 768 entities, but you can't have that many dynamic ones. I think it's like three or four or 500 actual rockets and things like that in the world. Um, so you're talking a mega RAM, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, sure. You know, every rocket in the world is going to have if an admin is kicked you or not every grenade of the world will have a boolean that holds whether or not he, you have a camera out in the world it just wastes ram it's not a big deal the total amount of ram for all the entities is sub a megabyte so it's fine it's fine um yeah so you can see all of these are member variables of the entity class and most of them are just not used by most of the entities, and that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so um, <laughs> there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. Um, and so, if you want, you can add new. You can add new member variables like that if you want. It's not going to hurt anything. Now, if you if it doesn't have a dot in front of it, like you see how these have dots in front of it, that means add to the global entity class type this member variable if it does not have a dot and it looks like this that means it is a global variable so there's a global variable that holds how many teams can be on this map for hunted three for two forts two for four forts four uh, is four the maximum yeah it might be a fun mod to add support for more more teams you know seven teams on a map you know or something like that that could be kind of fun uh, but you can see if you look at these these all these globals, there's only four. <laughs> team one color, team two color, team three color, team four color, team one score, team two, you know. And so if you wanted to add support for more teams, you would actually have to make more global variables for a lot of things. <laughs> Which classes are illegal. That's, for example, this is used for like, hunted, right? So the, the president can't be a soldier, right? The president has to be a civilian. Um, and for the assassins, you have to either be a, was it a demo man or a sniper? I think one or the other, uh, all sorts of global variables, all sorts of global variables, all sorts of global variables. Is there a storm? Is there an earthquake? Is it daytime? So we can have dynamic weather events and things like that as well. Uh, what things are turned off on the current map? What things you get for free on the current map? Is this a mega TF map? And mega TF was a different mod of Team Fortress that was kind of my competitor, I guess. And we eventually built in support for their maps. They had a specific map type, and so we support them. Even though the guy who made it was kind of an asshole. Uh, Ambush, his name was. 
Uh, voting, you can vote on the next map. That's that exists. Max players per team. Um, should you give an advantage to people on one team? So, for example, if there's eight people on one team and two people on another team, you can make the people on the two-player team do double damage or whatever, which kind of evens things out a little bit. Um, what team number you're on, your old team number, how many lives you have left. So you can you can play a map where you've got five lives. And if you die five times, you're out. That's supported. N not a lot of maps use that, but I think you can set it as a global. So you just have it, you can have a, you know, 16 versus 16 game where each person has 10 lives total. And when you're out, you're just in spectator mode. And so that makes it a very different game. That changes the game a lot. Uh, we support custom Tia, uh, 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 capture the flag maps. So capture the flag was a mod. They have their own uh, flag system. And so this detects if it's a capture the flag map or not. Is it co-op mode? So there is co-op mode. Co-op mode means you play through the single player game as a custom TF character. And so you can play as the medic or the heavy weapons guy or a custom class and run through the single player version of Quake in co-op mode. It's kind of fun. Uh, one of my friends one of my friends runs a co-op server and so you can connect to it and it will drop bots on the server to play with you if there's not enough people and you can run through the quake one game as a heavy weapons guy or something it's kind of fun uh these are the different classes that are available um <laughs> uh who wrote these comments okay I'm, i don't know who this wk person is uh, civilian, uh, yeah, okay. So, these are all the different commands you can give in the game. So there is, you could potentially have a key bind on your keyboard for every single one of these things. Um, so scan for enemies, if you have the scanner. Drop a debt pack, if you have a debt pack. Uh, typically they'll use special, which is, I think, X and uh, skill which is bound to no special is bound to z skills bound to x zoom um spy to disguise yourself so all these things are actually key binds and so the client the client can uh bind these to different keys on their on their, on their keyboard so for example on mine i have bound j to be tf taunt and what that'll do is it'll have the player speak. There's five different bits of vocalizations. You can say, halt, you there, you know, that kind of stuff. And so you can hit that. And so, uh, you know, if your teammate's ignoring you, you can yell, you there. They'll look around, come on, let's go. You know, things like that. These, uh, these are the impulses. And so uh, when the client does any key bind, what it's going to do, like if the, if, if the client hits J, which is down to TF taunt, what that does is it sends to the server impulse 203. And so there's 255 possible commands that the client could send to the server. And they're, they're just defined in the mod. And so if you send impulse, if the client sends impulse 203 to the server, the server parses that and says, oh, that is TF taunt. Um, so if the impulse is 203, or the impulse is 204, or da 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 da, da. Um, That's okay, let's see here. All right, so yeah, right here. So uh, this is here. So when the, when the user hits impulse 200 or impulse 203, it calls this function here. And it's a giant if, else, 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 if statement. <sighs> if the impulse is TF taunt, do this. If the impulse is taunt two, do this. If the impulse is taunt three, do this. And so if you play taunt, um, uh, it, it, there's a spam prevention thing. So it only allows you to say something once every couple seconds or so. Every four seconds you can say something. And so uh, if you haven't said anything in four seconds, then it plays the sound, halt, you there, you know? And so that even source games of impulse, yeah. And so if the impulse given, because that's set by the server. So when the client says impulse 203, but they don't, 
But the client doesn't actually know they're hitting impulse 203. They just have a key bound to taunt. So they'll bind a key to taunt. They hit taunt. Behind the scenes, the client sends impulse 203 to the server. The server sets your impulse to be 203, and it calls this function, and it has this giant if statement that goes through all the different impulses that could exist. And if it's this one, then it plays this sound. If it's this one, it plays this sound. If it's throw grenade, then it throws a grenade. If it's to use your skill, it calls the job skill. If you're building something, if you call inventory, it prints your inventory. If you yell help, medic, does that. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of how you glue the the client and the server together. And you can you can make your own. There's there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of impulses left. Like I said, there's 255 possible ones, and probably two thirds of them are taken. But um, you can make your own. Um, yeah, if you want to use skill, it's that. If you want to sell your frags, it's that. These are the different colors in the game. So there's 15 colors possible. Uh, for players, you can have an upper, you can have a shirt color and a pants color, so you can set those. Uh, typically, blue team blue is set to blue shirt, blue pants. Team red is set to red shirt, red pants. But if you wanted, you can give people different colored shirts or whatever. And then there's a ton, a ton, a ton of defines, and these defines um, hold all the different variables you can think of. Uh, how much, how many, how much metal does it cost to build a turret? How much metal does it cost to build a Tesla? How much metal does it cost to build a camera? How much metal does it cost to build a teleporter? To build a sensor? To build a, a, the uh, invisible um, field generator? But it's like the um, force field kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so you can adjust all those values. And basically, um, again, control shift F is your friend. Like you don't, you shouldn't ever be reading through just like a big long file like this, you should be like, all right, you've played the game enough to know what it's called. It's called a teleporter or it's called a Tesla. And then you can control shift F for it. And my Tesla predates Elon Musk. <laughs> he was clearly, he was clearly a custom TF fan. <laughs> How much health these different buildings have. Um, Maximum ammo capacity, uh, just all sorts of things, all sorts of things in here. Um, in custom TF, they have special armors, so you can have um, you can have red armor, but you can have red Kevlar armor, or you can have red gel armor, or you can have red blast armor. In each one of the um, Special Armors uh, has you take half damage from a certain damage type. So for example, if you have Kevlar, you take half damage from bullets. If you have Blast Armor, you take half damage from rockets and grenades. If you have Ceramic Armor, you take half damage from lightning. If you have Asbestos Armor, you take half damage from flame. So, and Gel Armor uh, is melee, I think. Melee and nails? I think. Yeah. Um, these are all the different upgrades you can buy. All the different upgrades you can buy. All the different upgrades you can buy. <laughs> all the different upgrades. Ah, that, that's it. So um, there's a lot of things you can buy in custom team fortress. Um, and then other variables, if you want to change how things work. Um, heat seeking range, so it hunts around for targets that are emitting heat. Those are the heat seeking rockets. Um, how much the spread changes um, for different upgrades. Different jobs. How many shots you have in, in rocket launchers and grenades. How long it takes to reload. Uh, 
Daedalus was the uh, username of my roommate, my best man, Kevin Johnson. So I named one of the weapons after him, the Daedalus rocket launcher. It destroys metal. It's a good anti-sentry gun weapon. Works okay against people. If they have a lot of armor, it strips their armor off pretty fast. Doesn't kill them very quickly, though. So it's uh, more of a specialty weapon. How much you heal people with the medikit, how much you heal them with a spanner, how long it takes to disarm a debt pack, how long it takes to set a debt pack, how big the radius of a debt pack is. Um, yeah, there's defiance for so many different things. And um, again, rather than trying to kind of memorize them all, just think of, think of something that you like or dislike in the game and how you'd like it to be different and go from there. Okay. So we will pick this up again on Thursday and we should probably be able to about finish Quake C next Thursday. There will be no class next Tuesday. My surgery got scheduled, got rescheduled from Friday to next Tuesday. So I will probably put up a video or something for you guys to watch um, instead of class. And then, uh, um, your uh, proposals are due on Tuesday, next Tuesday. And then um, you'll have basically till the end of the semester to finish your Unreal Engine project and your your TF mod. Okay. Uh, where are all the sound files stored? Uh, good question. So the um, sound files are in your Quake Release Fortress sound directory. There's subfolders inside of there. I typically just throw things right into sound. I don't know. And um, but if you're if you're gonna make your own, you can make a blue deer folder and then put all of your specific sounds inside of there, so it's kind of organized a little better. And when people connect to your server, if you pre if you precache them, then it'll automatically download all the blue deer sounds to the uh, people connecting, and then they can hear your new sounds. And so, fortress sound, and then. You'll need to pre-cache. You'll need to pre-cache. Every sound that you want to add to the game stuff, you would just do one of these. And then it'll the client will load them at launch. And if the client doesn't have it, then it'll download it from the server. And then when you want to play them, you just call sound. Like that, and it'll play the sound. What kind of video? Anime video? An anime wallpaper waifu? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that, that, that's that's a that's a reasonable mod, I'd say. And if you do a good job on it, I'll incorporate it into the official custom custom TF mod. I meant to do that with Muya's. Muya did a pretty good job um, when he took the class. Open file, discard, stage changes, and commit. So that automatically pushes up to, to GitHub. What did Mui do? He made uh, he made a Counter Strike version of Custom Team Fortress, so that you start off with no money, and as you play. You get kills, and as you get kills, you get more money, which you use to buy weapons and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, Counter Strike came after me, so I've I've always felt like uh, Counter Strike was maybe a little bit derivative of my game, but you know, whatever, it was different. You know, I, I talked with the uh, the developer when it was in beta, and uh, offered to help him with it, and he he turned me down. It's a shame. It would, it would have been fun to have worked on uh, on Counter Strike for sure. <laughs> I, def I definitely would have made some uh, some changes to it. Um, uh, yeah, Samuya so added a, a Counter Strike mode, and and I need it, it had some bugs in it though, so I didn't merge it into the official thing. But um, well, he's he's taking IS fifty B right now, so maybe I could just make him as his final project, just clean it up a little bit and 
then I'll incorporate it into the official mod, and then people can play Counter-Strike mode. That could be fun. Yeah, thank you, Myers. I appreciate that. Although, uh, I don't know, the way, the way my life's gone has been pretty nice, so not really complaining. Anyone else have ideas about what they want to do for their Team Fortress mod? <laughs> Dolan, who's your group? Is it Vakalar and Lave? Okay. Hey, Brune, Span, Stafford, do you guys know what you want to do with your... Uh, Team Fortress mod. I can give you feedback right now if, uh, if you want. And Garrett. Mm -hmm. And Davis. <laughs> I would like to change the sound effects of game. I want to use my keyboard. Okay. Yeah, changing the sound effects is perfectly reasonable. Tear gas, the blur is the vision. Uh, yeah, there's tear gas that blurs the vision already in it, kind of. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a gas grenade that when you walk into it, it draws all this crazy stuff on the screen. It's called a hallucin is it hallucinogenic gas or something like that. You hear footsteps behind you. You're like, you hear explosions. Would changing the appearance of the actual characters require a blender? Not necessarily. So if you wanted, you could reskin the people. Honestly, if one of you guys want to do this, I'll just give you an A. I'll just tell you. If you want to replace the uh, the models with something that doesn't look like they're Legos, <laughs> uh, you'll have to learn how to animate them, though. That might be a little tricky. But <clears throat> um, so if you're going to edit the actual 3D model, Dolan, yeah, you'll need Blender. Um, and I can't really help you with that. I've used it before. I'm I'm not a 3D modeler. Um, the uh, my modeling days are long behind me. <laughs> um, but uh, the uh, there is you you can edit the skins. So if you want to edit the skins on a um, character, you can do that quite easily. It's it's just a um, picture. And uh, you can just it, open it in Photoshop and edit it. And then whatever, remember we talked about UV mapping? So UV mapping will like map this triangle to this part of the picture. And so if you were to like spray paint this part of the picture with red, then this would appear in red. And actually perfect red, 25500, is actually drawn in Quake as uh, full bright, which means you can see it through darkness. It's so like if monsters have red eyes, you can see them even if it's pitch black. Or if, um, um, Somebody's got a crosshair or something like that. It'll glow through the darkness. So there, that is a little little twist to be aware of. Quick anim animations are limited. Yeah, quick animations aren't skeletal animations. They're mesh animations. So what that means is there is a 3D mesh for the Quake Soldier standing. There's a 3D mesh of the Quake Soldier taking a step. There is a in fact player.qc. Should have all that kind of stuff. And so there is a frame of animation for the person with an ax out. Another frame, another frame, another frame, another frame, another frame, and these just loop. And so there are six frames of animation of the guy with the ax running out. Um, five frames of animation of the guy just idling, standing there, and it just loops over and over again. So these are not skeletal animations where you can animate the arm and this arm and... Nope, can't do any of that. All of these animations are uh, pre-done. And so these just, um, these are the animations. <laughs> and if you're shooting the lightning gun, there's two frames of animation where the guy going like this. And it just repeats over and over again. So these are just different meshes. And it picks, it picks these meshes out of the .mdl for, uh, format. So if you want to um, animate stuff, you have to add like if you want to make a smoother animation, you get more frames of animation. That's fine. But if you wanted to, um, like what I was thinking, like if, if any of you want an automatic in the class, 
just make the Quake Soldier not look like his head is a square, you know, and everything's square. It's like, anytime you can count the number of triangles in a mesh, like, that's too low. You know what I mean? Automatic in the class. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. Right? If you make, if you make Quake look nice, sure. I'll give that to you. I mean, it's going to be a lot of work, but yeah, sure, why not? I have a Casio keyboard with all kinds of sound effects. You could record via files. Yeah, that'd be fun. But, um, you know, make, make, it, make it look like it's, you know, don't change the, the aesthetic necessarily, but yeah, make it look like it's from this millennium. <laughs> right? This Quake is from 1996, I think, and Team Fortress is from 1997, so last millennium, right? And the, the 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 game client, like FD Quake World, actually has Bloom and HDR, and like it actually looks pretty nice. It just needs better models and better textures, and you know, then it'd be a perfectly good modern game. You know, 96 for Quake, yeah. Team Fortress was, I think, 97. It might have been. It might have been 96 also. It might have been end of 96. Yeah. Yeah, I think like October or December of '96 was when was when Team Fortress first came out, and then Custom TF came out in '90. I actually I actually took I actually did an independent study on making a Quake bot in '90. Six and maybe '97. And uh, the bot didn't actually go anywhere. But um, I learned the Quake engine well enough that I was able to mod it. And so I, my first mod came out in 97. And then I think 98 was when Custom TF came out. Something like that. Kind of at the height of Team Fortress's popularity. Team Fortress 1's popularity. Something like that. Might be off by a year. One way or the other. Yeah. So just, uh, yeah, making it update. Update it. Make it look good. Yeah. Why not? There's honestly no reason why, you know, you'd want to play Call of Duty. You know, it's like, an our game's kind of garbage. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm biased, but I've just been super unimpressed by, you know, all the modern warfare, Call of Duty knockoffs that just keep kind of recirculating these things yeah like the animations sure the, the the player graphics absolutely they're terrible you know because they're super old need to be updated that's what i'm saying like if you, if you update them i'll give you an a why not current game devs are hella lazy yeah quake has polygon count limits kind of but um you know fd quake uh doesn't right and so I, i'd be fine making a a version that only runs in fd quake because that's the only client i use but i do know other people use um Fuck Quake. So, uh, FD Quake supports the uh, Quake 3 model format, which has much higher detailed models. Hmm. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is Quake 3, right? So you can have much better. That's Quake 2, it looks like. Is that Quake 3? Okay. It's like quick two to me. Um yeah, though. <laughs> it's funny. I don't know what that is. Uh yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you you can do much higher detailed stuff in Quake Three and FD Quake supports that. So you can have things that don't look like they were made by Legos. <laughs> That's a little bit better, I guess, than the, uh, the original Quake character. Yeah. So, there you go. I'll toss that out there as an idea for you guys. But uh, what, you'd be mod what you'd be modifying in that case is uh, player.qc. Player.qc has all the animations in it. And it's got... There's some weirdness like this. So this is some this is some weirdness. But what this is doing 
is Quake Champion models. Yeah, that, yeah. If you want to import the Quake Champion models into it, sure. Um, if FD Quake supports it, which it may or may not, I'd have to look it up. So do you, do you see this thing? This is a function. It's a function named player shot one. Uh, it's a void function, takes no parameters, named player shot one. And it's got this square bracket thing here. So the square bracket thing here means um, set the player model to this frame shot at one. And so again, in the MDL file format, there's a bunch of meshes, one named shot at one, one name shot at two, one name shot at three with a person in different configurations. And this is just saying set the player's frame to be this one. And then after, uh, when the next time we animate, call player shot two. And so this is a way of running a series of frames in order. So this will set the, the current player's frame to shot at one. After, you know, the next time we animate, call this next function. And then it's going to set your weapon frame to be one, which is your gun recoiling. And we'll do muscle flash, which will draw a burst of light around you. The next time the frame updates, it calls player shot two. It sets your current animation frame to player shot two with a gun probably up like this. The next time we update the animation, call player shot three. It sets our weapon frame to two. Again, we're animating the, the gun. And, and so then after it finishes the shot, it will call player run which is your default running around animation. And so this is how animations, it's like this weird custom C, Quake C custom code kind of thing that is um, because they use mesh animations. Like they just have a bunch of different meshes and they just switch out which mesh is playing. So you have these really low frame rate animations, which you could you could fix if you want to have a double the, double the number of frames and an animation will look a lot nicer. Up the triangle count look a lot nicer. So where are the image files for the characters? Um, they're supposed to be in the skins directory and I don't see a skins directory here. Uh, they're probably in a pack file then. Um, So pack files are basically zip files. And uh, it's pretty common when people release a uh, mod, they just pack everything up. Um, and so they've got things like this. That, uh, so you just release one file instead of having a directory with like 9,000 things in it. It does make it more annoying to find things though. Uh, I don't know. Um, it's going to be called like a hmm. TF Pyro is the skin. So there's different skins and basically what happens is when you pick a class, you have the model for the player and then the skin will change. These are different, um, these are different um, PCX files, which again, you can just open up in um, Photoshop. But where are they? That's a good question.
It's in skins. Oh, it's in Quake World skins. That's a weird place for it. It's a strange place, but it. okay. So anyhow, so uh, it's in the skins directory inside of Quake World instead of instead of Team Fortress. Uh, it'll it'll look into both directories. I don't know why it defaulted there, but um, yeah, you can see if you double click on that, you can see here is um, the Air Scout skin. So it's a scout that has a jetpack on it on its back. Um, and so Tia Pyro is here. And so if you want to edit it, you can just simply open this in Photoshop and change, you know, whatever you want. The, uh, the color of the gun, the color of the armor, you know, whatever. And, um, <laughs> wow. This was made back when they were still at, in college. That's funny. Team Fortress guys. Sniper. So you can see just how small and low res these things are. So if you wanted to um, update these, make them higher res, higher res models, I'm all for it. That would be an excellent mod in my opinion. So, yep. So if you wanna, if you wanna bring the uh, models into the 21st century, yeah, I'll give you an A in the class, why not? It's got to look good, though. It's got to look good enough for me to put in the official release. Okay. Well, we've, we've gone past our time already, you guys, so... Um, that'd be easy? I don't, know. I don't know if it'd be easy. I mean, I'm not a modeler, but if you're good at modeling, it seems like a pretty solid uh, chance to get an A in the class. And if you want to redo the sound, I mean... I know, I know a couple of you guys are talking about redoing the sounds. If you do a really professional job on it, like really professional job, good enough to like replace the, to actually replace the default sounds in there. Yeah. Give you an A too. Why not? Like if you can, if you could radically improve the quality of the mod of my game, hell yeah. I don't care. Okay. So yeah, talking amongst your, yourselves. Talk, to, talk it amongst your group, and then uh, just contact me on Discord and just give me a heads up what you want to do. Because I don't want to have three groups all doing the sounds. Like that's kind of right. Like, come on, you know, I want, I want to have a good mix of things in there. Maybe some groups can make a new weapon or make a new game mode or something. If somebody needs help with gun sounds, you might be able to help. Tristan. Have you ever heard a gun, Tristan? With your own ears? Because you always have your, your cans on, right? You always have your lid on. <laughs> Do you actually know what it sounds like? <laughs> I mean, it could just all be like... <laughs> you only know what it sounds like through, through your lids. <laughs> it sounds like tinnitus. Yeah, uh, but yeah, Tristan. Uh, Tristan here works in a gun shop. Sometimes he's semi-retired now, but um, last semester he actually helped out some of my students in this class. Um, they wanted to make a realistic gun game with realistic loading and things like that. And uh, I remember Tristan talking about um, in John Wick, uh, Keanu Reeves actually learned how to load shotguns. Uh, he would, I think, palm two shells at a time, and, like slam them in, and then palm two more and slam them in. And do like a quad load like that. And um, first time I experienced no ear protection, never forgot that one. Yeah. <laughs> and so since the uh, students were working on a game that had realistic reloading, I'm like, all right, Tristan. Tristan knows that stuff pretty well. You should, you should go talk to him. So he helped out last semester. He's one of our he's one of our alumni here. He's a all around stand up guy. So if you have any gun questions, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer them. He's, uh, he knows his stuff. Quad loading pro move that competitors use all the time. Anything gun stuff, let me know. Yeah. 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 Keanu was training at Terran uh, Firearms to try and make John Wick look as realistic as possible. And I, I think it came through in the movie. Right? I think that dedication to detail is 
one of the reasons why John Wick did well. You know? Yeah. Okay, so that's it for today, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, again, next Tuesday, I'll just post some sort of video for you guys to watch. Um, just get cracking on your Unreal Engine mods and uh, really talk in your, your group ASAP about what you want to do for a mod. Because, it'll like I said, I don't want to have three groups doing sounds. You know, I prefer one group doing models, one group doing sounds, another doing a gameplay mod or a weapon mod, okay? So get get your proposals into me, and uh, I will approve or disapprove of them. If you do left ear sound, you do right ear sound. <laughs> Just your tinnitus. <laughs> it's the most realistic mod ever. After enough gunfire's gone off, you just hear this high pitched squealing sound. Hundred <laughs> percent realism. All right, I'll see you guys.